All right, thanks again everyone for being here tonight. My name is Jeremy McLaughlin and I'm the chair of the ACES student chapter here at San Jose State and I'm happy to introduce our speaker for this evening, Mark Hanel from Figshare. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Mark when uh, we worked together at Digital Science and um, I can honestly say that Figshare was then one of my favorite platforms and still today professionally and personally, um, I really do love Figshare. So I'm a convert. <laughs> um, Mark has a PhD in stem cell biology from Imperial College London and he developed Figshare when he was still a student there um, essentially as a way so that uh, much of his content and what he was creating in his classes, um, he could share that and, and really bring it to the light of day, which is something I'm sure many of us can relate to. Um, especially me as a, as a student who's not planning on doing an e-portfolio, the idea that I can use a lot of my coursework and some of the research I'm doing on the side and that someone might be interested in that and there's a way for me to make that shareable and citable, uh, to me that's, that's really exciting. Mark's involved with open science, open data, open access in a variety of ways and through a variety of uh, international and global organizations. I don't uh, hesitate to say that he really is an open advocacy rock star and um, I'm really thrilled to just have him here with us tonight, um, especially since it's 2 a.m. in London. So thank you, Mark. Um, Mark has less time for questions, so if you do have any throughout his uh, talk, uh, please put them in the chat box or feel free to hold on to them and we'll integrate uh, chatted questions and live questions at the end. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mark and uh, thank you again for joining us, Mark. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, <laughs> I'm a little bit croaky, sorry, uh, due to, I would blame the, the late night, but it's also just uh, a little rundown from, from the cold weather over here in London at the moment. And um, thanks a lot for having me because <laughs> it, it is the start of open access week and I'm, I'm excited to be uh, to be talking about something that as Jeremy says I, I, I do care about and, and the good thing is that other people seem to care about it now as well so uh, well people care, cared about open access a long time before I even knew what it was but um, it seems like there's a lot of interesting shaking up going on in this space at the moment and um, especially for those uh, in library studies and those involved in this space now it is really becoming an interesting space for them because um, they're, they're more and more becoming more and more crucial parts of the institution and controlling uh, how the institution moves forward but it's, it's also interesting because the skill sets are slightly changing and it's interesting I'd be interested to hear uh, how everyone is um, adapting to that and what the different things are going on at different institutions um, and as, as Jeremy mentioned feel free to uh, heckle or hold up your hand at any time and if, if, if I don't notice them then I'm sure someone will, uh, someone will shout at me. Um, so hopefully I can flick through these slides now and yes, we're away. Um, so as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about open access academia. Jeremy gave me a lovely introduction there explaining some of the stuff that uh, we do at Figshare. Um, I'm, I, this isn't going to be an advert for Figshare, don't worry. If you, if you want to go find out more about that, you can, you can go and look at the site later. But, um, it's mainly just talking about what I think is interesting in this space and what I think the, the unknown unknowns and kind of what could happen and why it should happen and what are going to be the reasons to hold it back and how the library is important in that space. Um, and so obviously the, the big instigator of a lot of change has been uh, the rise of open access. And if you, if you look at this graph here, this is... Uh, Cameron Nayland shared this graph which just shows just the main open access public publishers of which you know this, this is 2012 and, and ones like Frontiers, Frontiers I know now is the sixth biggest open access publisher so so there's really some some changes going on and different people are, are growing in the space and we're starting to see lots of explosive growth uh, it's, it's not at the point where the majority of uh, stuff that's being published globally is open access but I think uh, it's well accepted now that we're past the tipping point and we are moving to a world where all um, scholarly publications that are publicly funded will become open access in the not too distant future. So this, this is a great way to start the talk, but it's also, you know, problem solved. Uh, we've, we've achieved what we set out to achieve and this was a, 
a, a dancing Spider-Man who, who really, really uh, brings home this message that we've done what we need to do now, so can we all move on? End of talk, right? Well, it's, it's kind of a lot more complicated than that because a lot of the things that we're seeing are, this is a graph by a guy called uh, Ross Mountain. It's, it's a messy slide. I, I know Ross, I feel I can call him out on some of his work here, but it just demonstrates just some different things um, and just looking at open access as a driver for change, what's happening with regards to uh, article processing charges and so how much you will pay uh, to make uh, a, an article openly available to all people. And of course, what that actually means in terms of openness. So on the left hand side, you've got the different licenses and at the bottom, you've got the cost and you'll see there's a good spread there. You've got some open licensed free journals that a lot of people probably don't know about. At the same time, you've got some really expensive journals that are non-commercial and therefore are they really fit for purpose in an open access world. Uh, and I mean, this is this is one thing that a lot of people think about what we do with Figshare and, um, and my own personal views, but you know, everything has to be open. And uh, I know my own thesis was under embargo for two years. I know that not everything can be open and there are reasons why, but it's more about making sure that everybody is in control of their research, releases it appropriately, and where they can release it under the least restricted license they should do. But this just demonstrates this, this messy slide kind of, there's a lot of change going on and there's a lot of different uh, business models coming out of this at the moment. Um, so, one of the things that has come about this year is we're starting to see um, people releasing data on open access. Um, so it's, it's got very meta very quickly. Uh, this is some data sets that were released on Figshare nicely at the beginning of the year in March uh, based on, and it was the Wellcome Trust that started it. So the Wellcome Trust is you know, one of the big funders in the UK and they've always been very progressive in their thinking. And so they just decided to say, well, we're spending money on, on open access, uh, so let's be very transparent about it. You know, let's, let's see where those APC charges have been in the UK for uh, 2012 to 2013. And, you know, everyone's expecting, well, we know where this money's going, all these big open access publishers that I showed you the slides of before. I won't flip back because it'll, it's, it's a bit of a lag there, but you can see here that Welcome Trust is sharing this data. That's an interesting thing for them to do. They're doing it, in my opinion, I think they're doing it, and I've spoken to Rob, uh, Rob Kiley, who released this data since then, and he was doing it because he thought it was the right thing to do, that, you know, just like open government, you should be making this data available. It's publicly, uh, it's, it's charitable funds, and they want to know what's been going on with that research, so they want to know what's happening with that money. Um, interestingly, when they did make this data available, uh, it's not a case of if you, if you build it, then they'll come, but in this case, Releasing that data, people did come, and this is a post on the um, Open Knowledge Foundation blog where they said they made this data available and all these people here got a shout out for actually they went in and then just started cleaning up the data and trying to find out the patterns and seeing what's going on inside all of this data. And that's, that's an interesting thing for a start, you know, the idea that it is true, not everything gets big in the open source community if you make it available, then people are going to, if you open source your code, then people are going to build really cool stuff on top of it and do the work for free for you. That's not true. But there is good examples where if it's interesting data and if it's of public concern, people will get involved and people will clean it up and do some cool stuff with it. So these guys came along and they just did some, you know, nice rough analysis of this and they did, you know, the people built an app on top of it so you can interrogate the data. And it's a good thing they did because, I mean, there's a lot of different publishers out there who are known for different things, and um, we work with publishers, so I know, I know I, I have a newfound respect for a lot of academic publishers in that they're a lot more forward-thinking than I ever gave credit, them credit for when I was an academic. But I think a lot of people were shocked to see that the uh, number one recipient of Wellcome Trust money for APCs was um, Elsevier, who uh, famously uh, had some negative feedback in the past about their open access policies and what have you. Um, and when you look and see people, you know, it's, if the data's available, people will come in and start digging around and seeing, yeah, also what the highest APC and the lowest APC was. And you can see there's this big, big variance in the price here, you know. Even, even at Elsevier, where they uh, do have the highest APC, they also 
made things open available, openly available for £350. I'm English, I do it in British pounds, sorry. But um, this kind of interrogation into the, the new models is, is something that I don't think anyone was aware of. It's all very new, you know. Open access has it's been around for a while, but it's, it's really coming to its own in the last few years, and I'll touch on that in a moment as to why that's happening. But just just this as a, a starting point, a little data set that was released and some interrogation by the community really shows that there's a lot of different things going on, and this is just one aspect of things that are changing. Open access is a driver, but if we look at it, we see there's a lot of different things going on just in this one data set. And I, I mentioned Elsevier because um, uh, there was uh, a, a petition, a boycott started by uh, Tim Gowers, who's a uh, Fields Medal mathemat mathematician, who said he didn't agree with their policies and he wasn't going to publish with them, and he suggested others shouldn't too. And he actually did a Freedom of Information Act and, and looked at how much um, all of the 20 of the UK universities were paying for their subscription to Elsevier journals. And it, it worked out that each of them were paying, on average, over a million dollars. Um, so, yeah, £16 million over a million dollars. And, and again, this is information that people in libraries and critical institutions probably knew, but it, it also raised the questions and it, it stirred a lot of uh, interest in, could we be doing something better with this um, money? And it's, it's, there's people who have mixed views on this because they say, well, you could start it as an academic project and you could put some money into it, you could put this money into it, a million dollars a year would go some way for, for interesting new business models or in, interesting new innovative platforms within the institution. Or there's others that say, well, they provide a good service and they're, they're doing some interesting things with the research and, and, and trying to be forward thinking, so perhaps that's a reasonable cost. Um, and if we're thinking about how this is actually going to affect people, then people started calling us out, and Tim Gowers, again, was one of these, but it said they noticed that Elsevier were charging for um, access license fees uh, for a university, and then the APC charges as well, and this thing called double dipping. So a little bit of open data, and suddenly, um, not necessarily intentionally, but Elsevier was... They had it brought to their attention that there was a few things they needed to sort out, and they've addressed those since then. So it's, it's a nice way of opening up some data uh, about open access publishing and the community moving forward and everything getting better. Uh, because if we are um, looking at what can be done with one data set, and I suppose Tim Gowers had a data set as well, it, 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 it kind of started the trends, and this is all happening in this year, this is the beginning of this year, so this is April sometime, I think Cambridge decided to start making their uh, data sets available on who was, who, what they were paying for on their open access charges. And this is, uh, you know, the UK is an interesting one because obviously it's, uh, it is now the rules that you have to make any publicly funded research openly available. Uh, the different rules in different territories, and I'll touch on that in a little moment, but uh, because the UK has this, then because uh, Robert Cowley, the Welcome Trust, did it, universities started doing it. And um, we actually had, uh, this is last week, um, people went and said, well, we want to know what everyone's paying to other universities in this Freedom of Information Act. Let's go and find out what the universities are paying for all of these other journals. So this data has been made available in the last year. So we have social scientists digging into this and library scientists digging into this. And you will notice this is in the library and information studies category on Digshare. So uh, I know there's a few people who have been in this crowd who might be interested in it. Uh, so dig around and, and share your research data in the same way. Um, and that was me promising it wouldn't be an effort. But this is, in one year, a complete change into understanding exactly how this system is working. And people, there's always going to be this kind of shaking of the tree with these open access changes because people are saying you have to do this. And when people say you have to do this, these changes are going to cause problems. It's not going to be perfect the first time around, as we're seeing. But it's, it's very nice to see that we're thinking of things in a transparent way. And it's very nice to see that the, uh, the funders, you know, the Wellcome Trust, the universities, everybody who has got a stake in this is playing a role and trying to do things better. The publishers are doing it as well. And that was interesting for us because um, 
Wifig Share, as, as Jeremy mentioned, it's, it's, it's basically a platform where anyone can upload any digital content and make it openly available. And I'll be honest, um, there's, there's two reasons why you think you could cheat, people should do this. And there's those who have ethical and moral uh, reasoning, you know, the idea that half of clinical trials aren't published and a lot of negative data isn't published and it actually leads to bad science. And there was that cover of The Economist uh, last year it was the biggest press attention this story's got so far, but the cover of The Economist is a big deal because they were saying basically that a lot of, particularly life sciences research, is fundamentally wrong because you can't reproduce it and you are skewing, the system is skewing for um, only positive results and there's nowhere to put negative results. Uh, and so I had a lot of that stuff and my main concern was, hold on, it's quite a competitive market, this academic space. So uh, I need to be having more credit for my research than anyone else. I need to, when I go into an interview for a postdoc, I need to be able to say, yeah, they may have uh, one more paper than me, but I, I worked hard this whole time and I had lots of content that was digital that I just couldn't get into publications. I had lots of videos, I had lots of data sets. Uh, so Figshare came out of that. Um, the egotistical side of things to make data, to make my research available to, to hopefully benefit my own career. Uh, and when we opened it up to other people, people started uploading lots of different content. And more importantly, everything that was uploaded was kept private until you cho chose to make it publicly available. Uh, we've expanded on those functions, uh, that functionality a lot because we found a lot of people were just using it for the private space. And at the time, we were, you know, really pushing hard the message, you know, make your data available where you can. And, this is good for academia. Uh, so we were interested into why people weren't making their content available. And um, we noticed that we had a stat that 40% of people who were using Figshare were uploading files privately and never making them publicly available. And of course, there's the issue there that they might be waiting for the right time to make it available, which is actually put embargo periods and things like that in the mouth. But we asked them, you know, um, why are, are you not sharing your research? And some people said, well, we're not sure we have the permission to share our research. So we said, well, who, what, what, what is this reason that you are not sure whether you have permission to share your research? And you can see of this here, um, there's overlap as well, but the, the three main stories were, I'm not sure that my PI allows it, I'm not sure whether my institution allows it, and I'm not sure whether my funder allows it. And this, this ironically, the, we got the results of this um, survey that we sent out to all our users on the same day, or the, sorry, the week after the Wellcome Trust were making their data available on Figshare. So we knew we had people who got their funding from the Wellcome Trust, and they were saying, uh, we had these students saying, well, we don't know if our funder lets us make our data available in this way and the funder is using it themselves. So there's obviously something, this breakdown in communication happening somewhere. Um, and it gets even more severe when you think about kind of who's telling these people to do it. Because if you're um, in the US, you've got the NSF saying um, in last year, the beginning of last year, 2013, they said, um, we need to incentivize people. We need to make these researchers want to make their data available. Like I wanted to make my data available for the extra credit it could get me. They were saying, you know, um, well, if we incentivize you, so if you're in your uh, biographical sketch, you can say, well, I've got some data sets. I've got some software that's been cited more than the two papers that I've written because that's just not how my science works, you know, or it's, it's, it doesn't have impact in the same way. Then there's this idea that you're incentivized to do this. But this came out a year ago, and we've still got people saying, I don't know whether I can. So it's, it's an interesting one here. I'd love to hear people's opinions on ways we could handle this, because in the library, this is where I see a key role, you know, the education, the idea that these, these people in the library, the librarians we speak to, they're the experts in this field. They're up to date on this, and yet the students don't know. And I spoke to some librarians and they say, well, how, who should we be getting to tell the library, to tell the students? And they say, well, who, who in this room knows a lot about this stuff? And who's got direct contact with the academics? So I think there's a huge role, and this is one of the reasons why the librarian's job is becoming more and more important, is because um, 
the funders are saying you you should be doing this. They're saying we're going to help you out and incentivize you for getting credit for other things. But they're also actually saying, you know, this is over in Europe, Neely Cruz, Vice President of the European Commission. Um, they've got this Horizon 2020 project, and they're saying, if you look at the bottom there, that's why we will progressively open access to the research data too, and why we're asking national funding bodies to do the same. So the European Commission is saying, as a... Uh, as a nation, you should be getting your researchers to make all of their data openly available because they fund it. They want to know what's happening with their research, just like the universities do. In the US, National Science Foundation, same story. Investigators are expected to share. So they're expected to share, but they don't know they're expected to share because this is written in a white paper somewhere. Actually, if you look at the URL at the bottom, it says nsf.gov forward slash pubs forward slash policy docs. When I was an academic, that is the last URL I'd be clicking on. Policy docs are not my forte. Um, but they're saying, you, not, that, not only that you should, we expect you to. So there's, there's a real interesting thing going on here. And this is actually, when I say that open access is driving one change here, this is, this is another driver for that change that's really shaking things up and, and seeing where things settle. It's not just the NSF. The NIH uh, expects a timely release and sharing of data. They actually came out uh, in September and said that all genomics data as of, that they fund as of January has to be made available. Um, as did the American Heart Association. They said all, all everything that's coming through them, has all the data has to be made available. And data here, I mean digital content. It can be 500 videos. It can be, um, not to forget the humanities. It can be, you know, um, all these different types of research data that are coming out here. It could be physical objects. It could be, um, we had some nice 3D printable file share the other week. It could be, you know, music and performance and things like this. But even the humanities, which people say are treated very differently and have different needs, that's true. But the NIH, NEH is committed to timely and rapid data distribution. So this is happening. They're saying we need to make this happen. Um, the, Big, big pushes from where I've seen it, as well as these funders, is obviously if the White House says something, it gets a bit more press attention and people start taking it a bit more seriously. And so they're saying that when they, uh, this was a result of a petition, uh, and the OSDP said, yes, we're going to make things open access papers and open access to the uh, digital data resulting from federally funded scientific research. So that is a lot of funders and a lot of important people saying, this is going to have to change. We're going to have to do that because there's this idea, I mean, uh, there was a great uh, figure in Nature published which said, asked uh, academics what they thought about data sharing. And 67%, uh, two-thirds of them said that not sharing data was scientific malpractice. And of the same thousand people it was that, that they uh, interviewed, 31% uh, of them said that they were willing to share their own data. So 67% said it's malpractice if you didn't, but only 31% said they'd do it. So a third of the people they interviewed were happy that, happy to go on committing what they considered to be scientific malpractice. So when you get to that situation, you don't want to get it's a whole balance of carrots and sticks. And the people who've got the biggest sticks are the funders. Um, so hopefully uh, that's, that's changing things. But if you're a researcher here, this is my artistic interpretation of, hold on a minute, my life is busy enough already as it is. You're, you just show me that graph about open access publications. And there's, there's, there's an interesting thing about open access publications because the, I'll touch on this in a minute, but the business model has changed. If you're saying that open access publications and article processing charges is the future, which has happened in the UK, that's the recommendation. They recommend gold open access. Um, then if I'm a publisher, I want you to publish as many papers as you can because I get more money. So there's questions about whether you drop the quality of papers that you accept. And there is these predatory open access publishers who will just publish anything because it's a business model. Um, so when we're talking about new business models, not all of them are good. Not all of them are positive things. And if you're an academic, you're thinking, you know, the, the amount of content that's growing is, uh, is happening at an exponential rate. You know, there's a doubling in academic con uh, publications every couple of years. So how am I supposed to filter this? What am I supposed to be doing with all of this content? 
And and hold on, Mark, you're now saying to me as well, not only do I have to deal with the eighteen thousand papers, I have to, in my in my niche field, I also have to deal with data. And this is an interesting one because from what the funders are saying, we actually have it in the UK. Uh, the, the UK, they have the first um, mandate from a funder. So the EPSRC, um, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, has said that as of May the 1st, 2015, if we fund someone at your institution, you have to have a solution in place so they can make their digital outputs publicly available. So they've pushed it straight onto the institutions. They've given them no money. And again, it's kind of who has to deal with this in the institutions? It's the librarians. So we're telling you um, that already you're going to have to make your open access, your publications open access. There's going to be this wave of information coming at them. And you're going to have this wave of data as well, you're now saying. And this is my six points that I think are an inevitability. Um, I think we're past the tipping point with open access. I think the statements I just showed you from the funders in America, but we also see it in the Western world, in Australia, in Europe, in the UK. Um, and we're going to get these six steps. So it starts with recommended open access to scholarly papers, then recommended open access to all digital outputs, then mandated open access to scholarly papers, then mandated open access to digital outputs, then enforced mandated open access to scholarly papers, and enforce mandated open access to digital outputs. And the enforce thing is an interesting one. I mean, Wellcome Trust will say, well, we'll keep the last 10% of your grant if you don't demonstrate that you've made all of your papers up so far open access. So you could say they're doing it already, but I don't think they're using the right technology to really check that in, uh, in a serious way. And if we look where we are today, um, I think we've already gone past, as I say, this man mandated open access to scholarly papers. and and the orange one there, point four, is, as I say, we, we're starting to get the first mandated open access to all digital outputs. So this is going to be this absolute tidal wave of information. And you could say that that's a good thing. You could say that it's a bad thing. I have my own opinion. Uh, I obviously think it's a very good thing. But you've got people, um, I saw a talk by uh, Pima Hane, who's the CEO of Digital Science yesterday, actually, and he was talking about Theodore Sturgeon, who's the science fiction writer. And he's, uh, he wrote lots of science fiction books, but he was famous for Sturgeon's Law, which was a throwaway comment he made once that 90% of everything is crap. Uh, he was talking about science fiction, but then people have taken it and run with it, and this poor guy is going to be remembered for that one statement, even though he'd done lots of other things in his life. Um, and you can say that about academic publishing, you know. Of course, you can say that one man's treasure is another one's uh, trash. Um, so how are we going to deal with that? And this is where we're starting to see real innovation. You know, What can we do that's better? Why should we be making this stuff available? And how are we going to filter it? And um, filtering is an interesting one. I mean, one of the places I really like at the moment is the altmetric space. Uh, so these are ways of measuring impact of academic content on the internet. Um, which isn't citations. Citations are still valuable. The impact factor is not valuable. I'm happy to say that out loud. Um, but citations are useful. They're, they're a measure of reuse. I mean, all we're talking about here is measures of reuse. If somebody's reusing your content, then it's got some impact and it's having some value. But what if your impact is, well, I wrote a paper to change the way that nurses work around the world. Nurses very rarely write scientific papers. You're not going to get any citations. Therefore, the funding bodies think you have zero impact. So uh, this is an example of altmetric.com, which um, shows you uh, how the, anything with a DOI or a persistent identifier, really, how much impact uh, these things are having. And a lot of people say, well, I'm not going to base my opinion on something by how much is being tweeted, because there's lots of areas for game, gamification. And the counter to that is, well, there's lots of areas for gamification in citations. We've got one metric. If you've got 100 metrics and you look at them all, you can see patterns and see who's gaming the stats. You know, if you've got 8,000 tweets but no citations, and then you'll see there's a story there. So you dig a bit deeper and say, oh, it's got 8,000 tweets, but it's all by the author. So you know that that's been gamified. And you can 
it gives you more knowledge about the system and knowledge is power so you can see exactly what's going on. Technology can be used to make this a lot better. Uh, of course, altmetrics work in a different way as well and we've seen this with Figshare um, that the publishers like to see publishers like to see how much credit they have to and uh, Altmetrics is a digital science company, they sit in the same office as uh, they sit behind me and um, they, uh, I asked them, you know, 12 months ago, kind of, but is it getting picked up by the main journals? Are you having impact in the impactful journals? And this isn't based on, this isn't ranking based on um, impact factor here, this is Google Scholar's H-index ranking. So, PLOS did really well in here, um, Archive did really well in here, which doesn't have peer review the archives, that's a really interesting change that's happening there. But um, in, I asked them 12 months ago, um, well, and there were two of the main top 10 journals were using Altmetrics. I asked them six months ago, and there was six, and I think this is now about eight or nine. So it's really moving fast. It's being picked up by the publishers because the publishers like to see what's going on with their content as well, and they want to see how they can work that system. But also, the academics, this is a company called Impact Story, um, similar company to Altmetric, uh, but they're focused more on the individuals, and you can see this is a, uh, an individual who can see the context, you know, highly cited and highly viewed, and they give you some uh, information there based on, as a researcher, how much, based on, compared to other people in my field or compared to other people this year, you know, what do these metrics mean? And this is great because this is basically a CV for an academic. An academic has to show, when I made my data available, this is to say, look at all the impact I'm having. So when I was talking about carrots and sticks before, you know, carrots are just as important. And we got a lot of traction with Figshare um, by saying, here's some metrics on your stuff. You get a profile on Figshare with your metrics and seeing how many views you have, how many downloads you have. You upload a data set, you get 10,000 views. But if I upload five more data sets, I get another 50,000 views. So it really does work like a computer game, and the brain does work, you know, in, in interesting ways. Badges seem to work for academics. Uh, it's, it's an interesting space because there's so much experimentation going on in this area. So there's still a lot of dust to settle here, but when you're looking for ways to incentivize people to do things, you have to make it stupidly simple, and you have to give them some carrots. Because if you're just told to do something, then you, you'll resented basically. I'm busy enough. I've got enough things on my plate. Um, and the interesting thing here again is the funders are onto this. So the Impact Story got a $300,000 grant from uh, the NSF last year. So for e at least a year now, the big funders are saying, well, maybe we should be looking into these spaces and seeing exactly what's going on here. Um, so where are we? And this is this is kind of when I'm thinking about what is these new business models, how are we moving on, um, this slide is just demonstrating that on the left-hand side you've got the printing press, and that was, you know, I think the first article was published 350 years ago in March, uh, so that's a long, long time ago, and it was it was the best way of disseminating that content at the time. Since then, there's been these amazing advances and everything like this, and, you know, um, that the internet came around in what the 60s and it was for academics to share content amazingly and while a lot of other areas have been disrupted if you look at the thing on the right which 10 years ago people wouldn't even predict because this picture's out of date now actually they've got nice new iPods, iPads out today but the iPad didn't exist so but what have they actually done they've taken that paper and put it into a, a digital format it's, it's not improved the paper in any way it's just, it's just you can carry loads of them around at once. Um, and if you think about it, you know, how all the other industries, dissemination of content, the music industry, the film industry, how the content models for how that's disseminated have changed so much. You know, Nature only went online in 1997, I think it was. So that was quite behind everyone else and, and how far have they got. Um, and this is what I was saying before about the publishers being forward-thinking. It's often the academics that are so ingrained in this 350-year-old system. And, and more, why wouldn't they be? They've, they've, you know, you talk to five-year postdocs and they say, well, I've played this system for 10 years of my life and I've put so much into this. We work hard, you know. Uh, why, 
why shouldn't uh, why should I can change what I do in if 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 the people who I care about don't tell me to, and the people who I care about are the people who pay my wages. That's the university, and that is more importantly the funders. So that's why the funders have felt they've had to step up and say, well, no, we pay for this. We, we want to be uh, as efficient as these other spaces. We want to be like open government. We want to see the social and economic benefits that can be built on top of this. And it's, it's not just about tech, adding technology. It's about using these new technologies to move things faster, forward faster. The idea that with all this data that's never made available, with all this research that's never made available because people don't publish negative results, there's a lot of inefficiencies and there's a lot of people, there's a lot of, you know, correlations and diseases that can be spotted by machines. We'll never get to the point where it's just machines, but that human machine interface will really take us forward. And so the funders putting their foot down and saying, we've got to change this and it's going to get messy. Um, so just with this here, you see that, um, this is the idea that do we even need publishers at all? This is by a guy called Jason Prem, and uh, he's saying it's the decoupling of the scholarly article. He's saying I can break down an article into different things. You know, I can. I hear he, some of them. You know, the idea that marketing can be via his Twitter feed. You know, um, preparation he can pay with someone to do his typesetting for a lot less than thirteen hundred dollars that Plaus will charge him to publish. Um, the one that I was always concerned about here was peer review. Because while you can break down a lot of these points, I still think peer review is what publishers do best. They have these, they can do better peer review models. They can do open peer review and post-publication peer review and, and things like this. But I'm not convinced at this stage yet that anyone's done enough in peer review, the peer review space to, to take anything away from the publishers. Plus, the article is a great format. Yeah, but, you know, people are saying, do we, do we need, you know, Mendeley where I can put my papers? Or do I need to send it off to a publisher? And um, the things that are coming out even in this space, this is what I'm saying about there's so much innovation going on in this space because of these drivers, because, you know, the funders fund billions of dollars in research. So if the funders are funding billions of dollars of research, then there's going to be innovation if they change their their model. And this is something that came out not too long ago um, from GitHub, uh, the science guy at GitHub. So GitHub is the where a lot of uh, people store their code. So they're even interested in this space now. And uh, our phone here is saying, well, we can do peer review better. So they're saying that maybe you can modularize it. I personally don't think the article is going away. Uh, I had somebody comment to me recently that, you know, the one reason why people still click download PDF is because you go to all these different uh, places, these different publisher sites, and the one consistent thing you'll have is if I click a download PDF, I'll get it in a format that I understand, which is an interesting point. I mean, you don't go to, uh, you don't go to, to different uh, music uh, publishers, you know, you don't go to Sony and see what they've got. It's, it's weird that academia still works based on this publisher art model, so I think the journal's gone going away, but the publisher models might change a little bit. Um, and this is all because the, this is my interpretation of the money is now in the hands of the academics, as I say. It's no longer that the librarians uh, and the administrators are choosing where this money goes. They're now becoming more in charge of the content within their university, and this, this money is going elsewhere, and they're seeing their money is going in two parts at the moment, so it's getting confusing to them. Uh, and there's a lot of innovation and technology popping up here. Digital science at the top, what we do, you're, is part of Macmillan Publisher, Publishers. PLOS Labs has come out this year. Uh, Springer acquired the uh, reference management tool and paper store papers. And Elsevier, of course, bought Mendeley. So the publishers are now thinking about technology, and that's really, really cool because maybe the publishers are, will continue to be innovative in this space because they have to now appease their new clients, which are the authors who want, you know, more bang for their book, etc. Um, and if we think about, well, you know, these funders are coming out with uh, statements about data and they're saying you're going to have to make your data available. If we look at the, um, the interest in big data, you can see that it's grown huge, but you know, over the last, since, since 2011, it really popped up. So you're thinking, well, when are the publishers, when are the academic publishers going to get involved in this space? And uh, the truth is that, that they already have. 
they, these are all data journals. These are all journals saying you send it, you put your data set in a paper wrapper because you know that you understand as a researcher that you get a paper and you get some credit. So even though the NSF is saying no, you can just release that data set. The academics are still in the mind frame, and they will be for some time that well, I should be shared. I can if I if I can make a paper out of this, then I'll get two publications. I'll get one for my paper paper and one for my data paper. And you know, the publishers get two APCs, so everybody's happy. And Elsevier launched another one last week. Uh, uh, Scientific Data from Nature, who we work with, is not on this, but they they launched one recently as well. And I think, yeah, we have been working with these publishers. But these are some of the publishers that we do work with. Uh, there's lots of different ones there. But the the publishers are starting to do innovative stuff. We work with them to visualize and host their digital content. Again, they're seeing business models on top of this. They're saying, you know, whereas you used to charge for color prints, we're seeing, well, uploads. If you have to make your data available somewhere, throw it in the stuff info and pay an extra $200 on your APC. We see that with exactly the thousand, but as a as a, an experience for the researcher, you get this great, you know, enhanced service. You know, the idea that PLOS, the biggest PLOS one, the biggest journal by volume in the world, at the beginning of this year was publishing uh, videos as links that you had to download the video. Name one other field in academia, other than academia, where you have you're expected to download a video on the internet. There's no place, you know, you, we, we, we've got used to internet technology. If I want to watch a video, I go to YouTube, I push play. I go to Vimeo, I push play. I go to my streaming sites, I push play. Um, so we're helping them do that. Uh, there's an accidental innovation coming out of this because they actually said to us, you know, we've got 200,000 data sets in HTML format within our articles. Can you go in and grab them, convert them into CSV, add some metadata around them, and then we've got a much more granular database of our digital content. And we actually now power their related content engine because it's a lot more granular in this space. Um, so this is a slide where I was looking at, you know, where, where we got some reasons on why people were using Figshare, why people were choosing to make digital, their digital content available. And there's seven things here, which three of which, I've, four of which I've lightened out here because, you know, it has also been reported that sharing detailed research data is associated with increased citation rate. That's true, but what's really kicking them is the legislative change, the funders' policies, because the people who are the you know scientists who are who think it's for the best, and that you know they're professors, the tenured professors, they have got a job for life, and they think it's the right thing to do, and good on them. We saw it from Randy Sheckman saying, "Don't publish in high impact journals." After he won the Nobel Prize, people said, "Well, you're just." pulling away the ladder once you've climbed it. But he's saying, no, I'm in a position to say this now, so I'm going to say it, because um, the message isn't getting through. The message is not going to get through until the people who are paying my wages come in and say, we'll take away your livelihood unless you do this. People suddenly get very interested at that point. Um, so what is this? What is innovation in open access at the moment? It's a very good question, and we, I don't have the answers. I'd, I'd love to hear other people's. So I don't know how much time we'll have to discuss that, but you can always get me offline. Uh, P J, they dropped the price. Basically, it's ninety nine dollars to publish. It's an interesting business model. Uh, they have a few different ways to do it. Obviously, if there's five authors, then that's still a five hundred dollar paper. But it's it's an interesting one. They they've won a few awards for innovation, so that's interesting. At the beginning of this year. PLOS had a data policy. They said everybody who publishes in PLOS, PLOS didn't have to do this. PLOS could have dropped the price like um, the PAJ, to PAJ prices. PLOS is a not-for-profit publisher. They made $30 million last year. They could have just dropped the price. But PLOS, as I said, publishers are innovative. PLOS made uh, a statement. They said, no, we formed PLOS with the view to change things. Open access is there. We've changed that. Now we're going to continue to change things, and they said to a lot of people's dismay, we're going to if you, any digital content associated with the paper, you have to make available. And people lost their mind, but people still do it, and people are still interested, and it's it's a very brave move from Plus. It's, it's great to see it. Um, could the institutions themselves just host all of their content? We have an institutional offering now that we, we've uh, got in different universities. 
for implementing them now where they're saying, we want to be in control of our digital content. Like I said, the librarians are going from a place where it's we're controlling what we buy in, buying back our research by, by paying out these fees and negotiating on these fees to uh, big publishers and what have you, to saying, no, we're going to be the gatekeepers of our research. And because we're the gatekeepers, we can do things better. We can make it openly available. We can power all of this. Uh, so that's an interesting one as well. And for me, um, because of all these different digital objects and, and things, it's, it's really about where, where are we trying to get to here with this. And you can have this so much heterogeneity. You know, there's all this other stuff. There's code. There's uh, videos. There's, there's posters that can be mined. And, and, and how, what's the point? Why are we doing that? There's more information. Granted, I might be able to find some more interesting stuff. But what's the point? And for me, this is kind of my vision of the future, which is it doesn't matter where the data lives. Uh, I say that with fig share at the top in the middle. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't matter where the data lives. It can live on GitHub. It can live in Triad. It can live in all these other places. Um, but if an institution wants to have impact, if that researcher wants to have impact, they have to put it in a place where it's got a few things. Because I think we're going to get to a point where People will do basic research and people will do research on top of research and they'll say, give me all the humanities economics data sets in the last three years that have looked at this with these tags from all of these different places, pull it into a nice web interface and just do the computation in the cloud. So it doesn't matter where it lives as long as it adheres to a few principles. Uh, there's a thing called data fairport, which stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And I thought that was a bit lightweight, but actually when you dig into it, um, I highly recommend you endorse these principles. They get quite detailed in what they think people should be doing with digital content. Um, these are the things that I think are important. And this, this is kind of my last three minutes here, by the way. Uh, so persistent identifiers are essential because if you look at this graph here, you see that all of these links, it's hard to tell, I think, uh, if I go to the next one, it's a bit easier. So you can see that in, if in 2009, if we looked back to 2001, 40% of the links to non-traditional publications, so data sets and videos, what have you, were broken. And people said, well, yeah, obviously, you know, people must have been linking to YouTube and they've changed their link structure or something, but that wouldn't happen at universities. When you look at where these links were, Harvard, NASA, Harvard, Caltech. So the things you thought you could trust to be around, these broken links were actually going to places which are placed beacons of trust. So persistent identifiers are essential so that you can manage, even if links change, you can manage that the URL still points to the same place. Um, APIs are essential because, um, as I say, I don't think that the human touch is going away. But I want to be able to say, show me, like I said then, or show me, I was a geneticist, show me every genome sequence for this type of fish in the last two years, which has got this gene mutation. And I'm, I'm not going to go to every single place, every single website and look for them. I'm going to say, I'm going to ask a computer, and they'll have nice pretty interfaces saying, go out and find me this. And it will query every site. And if your institution or your publisher doesn't have an API where people can come in and grab that content, then that data is not going to get reused in that way. So APIs are essential. Open access is obviously essential. I understand a lot of it is about control, but if you follow that API and then you hit a paywall, that's going to be difficult to reuse. It's not impossible, and a lot of people at the institutions will get through it, so it's great, and that'll still get reused, and that's brilliant but it's really hard for reuse of content in the long term, which is really what things like citations are and what we can really start to measure with just digital content sharing on the web. And this is my most important point, I'd say, because the advocacy, my point at the beginning about people saying, I don't know if my funder will let me do it the same week that their funder is doing it themselves, is there's a communication breakdown somewhere. And, and there's white papers, and white papers are great if you read white papers. But when I was an academic, there was no chance in hell you'd get me reading a white paper. You've got to stop shouting at people. This isn't pointing at the audience here. This is pointing at society in general. It's going to stop shouting at people with white papers, because no matter how hard you shout, I'm not going to listen. 
Um, so I'd advise anyone in the library community to to, to do their bit during uh, Open Access Week, and that's why I feel I can say that at 2.55. I feel like I can say you've got to advocate a little bit. Um, because the, the, the day... Hey, Mark, I think we've uh, lost audio on you. Um, it looks like it's throttling right now, so we'll give that a second. Well, it looks like Mark had an internet problem, so I'll just give him a minute or two to see if he can uh, make it back in before I stop the recording or anything. Sorry, I lost everyone for a moment there. Um, I don't know if we've, we've finished or what have you, but I was literally on the last slide, so I think you can hear me still. So I was just saying that the institutions have the power, and my last slide was, we really believe that uh, picture. These are our T-shirts. If anybody wants one, let me know, and if there's any time for any questions, I'll answer some. I'm sorry that it went at the very last minute, but hopefully you can still hear me. Yes, we can hear you, and yeah, that was a bit anticlimactic there <laughs> right in the last couple of slides. Um, open up for questions. Does anyone have uh, questions for Mark? Well, you know I do, Mark, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. <laughs> um, I actually was reading a paper recently about, um, it was a big data analysis paper on citation metrics and PubMed. And specifically, the author found, or was looking at, I don't want to say incorrect citations, but the citation patterns of papers that were the, essentially wrong. And um, not things that were found out to be wrong later, but things that were um, cited incorrectly or cited as being something that they weren't. So it was, it was an interesting data analysis paper. He looked at a lot of factors. But the bottom line was he saw a lot of citations for improper data. And you were talking earlier about sort of quality control, and I was just wondering what your thoughts were about, um, especially in open data repositories, some of the different initiatives for quality control there, and, and if you think it really does come back down to post-publication peer review, or if there's some other options for that. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I, it's, it's a really interesting thing as well, because the, the number of I think it's something like 50% of academic papers never get cited. Um, so you could say, well, they might not be any use to anyone, and this is why I was saying about old metrics are interesting, because it gives you other ways to investigate whether these things are having an impact. Obviously, with data, we've actually been doing some experiments ourselves with how you can uh, peer review things, and we're thinking that, obviously, using old metrics and using citation data is one way, because we do ask people to cite the content, and you can do it in the same way there. But And the other good thing about metrics as well is you can obviously analyze a lot more of the sentiment. It's very rare that citations are captured with the statement in which the person uh, cited them. They could be saying this work is terrible and cited 400 times. Um, but the, the way we're thinking about it at the moment is much that every different file type has to be slightly different. Um, you wouldn't review a poster, peer review a poster, in the same way you peer review some spreadsheet data. And scientific data uh, is peer reviewing data, the Nature Journal. So we're thinking that there's going to have to be data stamps. And data can be anything. You know, the, there's a journal of open research software that says, for this to be peer reviewed, you have to say, can you run the code? Can you do this to it? It's got a five checkpoint list. And I think there might be peer review services for things like that, but also it might be, you know, communities built around certain areas. If you follow, say, the, the category physics at a certain repository, and you've used your ORCID to log in, and you said, this is sound science, you could say, well, when 10 people have said this is sound science in your community, then you get a stamp saying this is sound science according to the community. And then when I was talking about if you're looking for uh, content 
you could say, well, I only want stuff that's of a certain level, or I only want stuff that's been through peer review of publishers, um, which is, again, another innovative kind of shaking the tree and seeing what falls out. We're not sure how it's going to work out yet, and that's why I say peer review of journals even is an interesting one, because, I mean, the best thing we have right now is three three people are peer reviewing a journal. And they're probably three people you know because you work in niche fields. I think we've seen uh, we've seen some big ones slip through the net. The stat papers uh, they caused a lot of attention. They got through, and then there's there's more and more attractions coming uh, because people are querying them. And there's people who are saying there was a guy who had 60 publications retracted this year because he set up loads of fake email addresses, and he ended up actually peer reviewing his own papers. So. The system as it is isn't perfect. The system that's uh, coming out now uh, has a lot of opportunity for new ideas, and you see things like um, Rubric, which is pre-publication peer review, like as a service. Um, And I think there's there's stuff happening there, but I think this is going to be one of the... I'm still very much in the consideration that I think we should be making this stuff available and then trying to filter it afterwards, the idea that you know, um, we can reverse engineer some of this stuff. Uh, we can add additional metadata later. Getting it out there is step one, making people share their data. Getting it in a machine and human readable form with some valuable metadata is step two. And then assessing the quality is step three. Uh, but it's, it's each one of those steps is, has its own layers of complication. Can you briefly discuss the uh, influence of open access in public or other non-academic settings? Um, so open access with regards to people who are investigating, just you know, doing their own diagnosis and <laughs> looking at. I mean, there's one of the people. A lot of people say one of the main arguments from for the people who argue against open access are, well, we uh, don't want to be we don't want the general. We don't trust the general public with this data. You know, if you're making open the content to build a nuclear bomb, do we want to make that openly available? There's, there's a lot of ethical considerations, and there's uh, particularly around data. Uh, HIPAA compliance is a big thing nowadays because you don't want personal data getting out. We've seen a lot of stuff like that recently in the news, and um, I think I think that that is kind of solved because. The, the idea that if something shouldn't be made available to the public, then don't make it available to the public. You know, the, the academics know what can and can't be made available. If you say to your funder, I'm not making this paper available because it's got commercially sensitive data or I've got a patent waiting, that's okay. But there's still a hell of a lot of stuff that can be made openly available. And, you know, the impact that that stuff can have, people out in... Uh, you know, who are treating Ebola need to get access to the, the most recent information. And if you're out in the fields and then suddenly you get a paper and it's behind a paywall, it's rid- it's, a, it's a ridiculous concept, you know, in a, in a fast-moving space. But um, I don't know, maybe, uh, do you have any other ideas there about kind of, there's interesting cases, uh, Jack, Arand- uh, Jack Andraka uh, was a 16-year-old who did some research on open access papers and found some interesting new... Uh, a way of uh, measuring protein expression. I, I think it was that was a 16-year-old who was just had access to the content, and he's been very big on. If I didn't have access to the content, then I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to, you know, I wouldn't be able to uh, have found the discoveries that I've made. And at the same time, there's you know, uh, there's, there's a 26-year-old postdoc in Colombia who's facing eight years in jail for sharing a, a PhD as a PhD thesis of somebody else on the internet. So it's interesting, it's very nuanced in, in different places, and, and obviously Aaron Schwartz comes into that as well, but some of the things are, are, are ridiculous, and a lot of the questions have been answered already, which is why I think we've passed the tipping point. That's great, thanks. Yeah, for me, a lot of those issues of quality control and public access um, come down to what my colleagues will uh, uh, agree with me, and it's something we focus a lot on in library school is, uh, you know, information 
um, literacy and, and, and just how people understand all this information that they now have access to and you know the, the quality control aspect and how that's built into the whole process is something that I'm I'm interested in myself so we can talk about that some other time um, any other questions from from anyone else Thanks everyone for bearing with me though because uh, yeah, I appreciate there was a lot of information and there was an internet connection problem at the end there and I overran but thanks a lot for uh, taking the time and sticking through it with me, I appreciate it. We don't, uh, we don't consider any of our sessions as ever going over so don't, don't worry about that. Thank you so much for being here at um, now what's now 3 a.m. your time, hopefully you uh, Timo or, or whomever you are reporting into will uh, understand it if you don't make it in at, at the crack of dawn. Um, I did want to quickly just uh, wrap up and say thanks again to everyone for coming tonight. Um, and thank you, of course, to Mark. Um, if you get a chance, everyone, please fill out the post-event survey. I'll put that in the chat box one more time. And um, I'm going to stop the recording now. So thanks again, everyone, for being here. And um, hope you enjoyed.